A battle for the mind of a 14-year-old boy. Leave me alone! Why do I have to stay here? I don't! I watched you change. I get this fear that he's going to hate me forever. The mother. It's not the same kid. Who fears her child is lost to a cult. The whole world is crying out for some kind of escape. They want an escape. Yes, you can be safe. Hallelujah. The son, who claims he's free to choose his own faith. They'll take the Bible and strangle you with it. And the deprogrammer, who pulls out all the stops. You're gonna sit down whether you want to or not. To fight what he calls mind control. Are they about the Bible or are they just a bunch of guys who want to control people? What are you doing? What are you doing, Mom? If a friend of yours or a child of yours were caught up in a cult or became a disciple of the latest self-styled messiah, what would you do? Some Americans turn to deprogrammers in an effort to get the child back. But that worries others who say deprogramming is at odds with American ideals of tolerance and religious freedom. Aside from the legal and moral debate, deprogramming is a gut-wrenching experience, a non-stop force-feeding of arguments and emotions in which a family tries to win back a loved one. This spring, 48 Hours was given unusual access to the rough and raw battle for the heart and mind of one youngster in Anchorage, Alaska. Come along with us now, inside the deprogramming of Aaron. April, the ice is melting in Anchorage. Well, Aaron wasn't in school a whole lot. He seemed to be a troubled kid. The church caught him at a very vulnerable point. He walked right up to his mom and he slapped one hand on her forehead and he put his other hand up in the air. He was trying to cast demons out of his mother. The boy's been totally brainwashed. Just, I mean, totally. Flight 1429 arrives. Rick Ross is here from Phoenix, Arizona on a mission. He is called a deprogrammer, but to Marna Parent, he may be a savior. This is Parent High. Rick Ross. So Marna Parent hopes Ross will free her son Aaron from the influence of a fundamentalist church called the Potter's House. A lot of people have gone through what you've gone through. You're not alone on this. And Aaron's going to be all right. He's going to be fine. I miss him. This is the beginning of the process. What do you hope will be the outcome in a couple of days? Um, realistically hope. That I can hug my son again, that he can tell me he loves me, that he'll feel comfortable at home and not feel like he's damned to hell because I made him leave that church. A moment after he passes behind her, Marna Perrin spots a man from the Potter's House Church watching us. Okay. But you know he's in the church? He was there. Did he watch you closely just now? He was standing okay. right here. All right. right. What does that mean? Well, that means that the church is aware of what's going on and that they're going to relay it to other people in the church. And perhaps to her son. Okay. Ross's tools for the deprogramming are simple. Let's, let's just load this up. Let's just load this up first. A trunk full of research and videotapes and a 220-pound weightlifter named Mark Workman. Workman is an ex-member of the Potter's House from Arizona. What now, considering there's a church member listening and looking on just a few minutes ago, how does that change the plan at all? It means that I'd like to proceed more hurriedly. I, I would not like to give the church any opportunity to respond before I can sit down and talk with Aaron. The next stop, an apartment rented for the deprogramming. You know, my son really wants to be a pastor. This is a tough church, a destructive Bible-based group. Some of, some of my professional associates prefer to call it a, a cult. The biggest concern, how to get Aaron to the apartment without arousing his suspicion. 
just tell him uh, I need your help with something and just uh, ask him to come along with you and come back to the condo. I hate lying to him. That's what hurts most about this is not being able to tell him what's going to happen, you know, before it happens. But I think if he knew what was happening, he'd run. Marna's cover story is that she's going to a friend's house to hook up a video cassette recorder, and she needs Aaron's help. Aaron is carrying the VCR. The other boy is Donnie, Aaron's 16-year-old brother. What I'm here to do is to, if you will, jumpstart Aaron's brain, to get him to start making his own decisions for his own life again. Hello. Hi. Hi, Mrs. Perrin. How are you? Hi. Hi. Hi, Rick. Hi. Don't bust the set, guys. <laughs> I think we better tell you what's happening, you know, so that you understand. Your mom is really, really concerned about this group called uh, the Potter's House. And your mom felt it might be a good idea for you to be able to talk to somebody about the Potter's House and see what, you know, what might come of it for us to have a talk. And I've come a very long way to talk to you. Your mom, if you guys want to talk to me, why'd you have to bring all this stuff? These men are from a news, a news agency that um, is, is, is following me. And they're interested in my work and they're and they're just following me. We're and, from CBS News. Yeah. And so I think what your mom decided when she agreed to uh, have me come over and knew that the news people would be following me on my work, that it would be all right because she feels that maybe this way other families might be helped and other people might be protected from getting involved with what seems to be, to a lot of people, a pretty destructive group. A group that's caused the people a lot of unhappiness. Nobody just, nobody just struck nothing. It was my mom who started the whole thing. You feel that the Potter's House is a really, really good church and that they, they do a lot of good things? Yeah, I know. All right. I know they are. You don't, you don't think there's anything that anybody ought to be concerned about? Not with that church. There ain't nothing wrong with it. It's only things that she's making making up and saying that the, they did this and they did that when they didn't. After 20 minutes of arguing about the church, so Aaron gets fed up. So there's a lot of fear on the part of people Ooh. in the church that if you don't pay your tithe, bad things are going to happen. Oh, yeah. yeah and I don't want to be part of it. I'll be the car. No, Aaron. 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 Leave me alone. Aaron, you're not leaving. I, I, I don't want to talk. I don't have to talk. Aaron, it's kind of Aaron just, leave sit, me alone. just sit here with me, all right? Leave me alone. Don't. I'm your brother. I'll be in the car. Aaron, no, Mark. Aaron, 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 just sit here. Aaron, Aaron I don't want to be part of you guys anymore. I did not agree to this. Aaron, Aaron go. Aaron, Aaron, you're Aaron, 14 come on. years old. What's wrong with you? Why are you fighting? You just have to sit down mother. and talk. That's I don't want to do. talk. That's the problem. Why? Because Why you, you got to lie about me. Nobody wants to I'm listen to you. I'm your brother. I love so, you. So I do then, listen to you. So, Aaron, you don't leave me alone. Things. You tell them to let me go. You're going to be in for it, man. Aaron. Right, you're staying here, son. Let me go. Aaron, come on. I'm sick of you guys. Aaron. Not everybody picking on me because of Aaron. Me. Aaron. And I never did nothing wrong. And neither did anybody else. Aaron. Let All me right. Go. All right. Aaron, it's calm just down. Aaron. Leave me alone. Okay, why down. do I have to stay in here? I don't. I'm Let here. Me. That's why you're sitting in here. Sit down. Leave me alone, Aaron. Aaron. Son. I'm your brother. Sit down. Oh, yes. You got to sit and talk about What are you going to call me tomorrow, huh? Aaron. You going to lie about me tomorrow? No. Aaron, this is right. Right. No, I don't want to sit, sit down. down. I don't listen. want to be a part hey, of this anymore. Listen, listen to me. Just listen for one second. I watched you change. Oh, yeah, the church, I did. The church I tried watched to make you suicide. change. The church tried to make me commit suicide three times. Mom, is that why I went into API for five days? No. For evaluation that they found out that it wasn't suicide. All we could do was just your lying. And I would do so much pain because he just said, oh, he's suicidal. I'll throw him in there. Just because you lied, that's so much power she's having more. That's why I don't want to be a part of it. Because she just lies to get me more stuff and I have to go through more pain. Well, don't you me. understand? I do understand. Yeah. No, you, you don't. You, you don't, don't listen to me. Nobody you listens you to me. Think, you don't think I'm just listening to me. All yeah. you guys say is that I'm wrong and that the church is wrong. Well, why not? That's your opinion. My opinion is it's not. Now leave me alone. All right, Aaron, hold it. Whoa.
Hold it. Now, Aaron, listen to me, because I'm going to tell it to you like it is. You're going to sit down whether you want to or not. Now, you can sit down the cool. easy way or you can sit down the hard way. Why do you I have to two options. You, you can stand up and scream and yell, or you can sit down and talk about your side of it. You're four now, wait a minute. Hold it, guys. You're 14 years old. You're a minor. This lady is your mother. The police, the courts, and everyone in this city tells you what the law is. And the law is that you're going to sit down and you're going to listen okay. to your mother Where's the phone? and you're going to talk. The cops and we'll see whose opinion it is. In its sermons, the Potter's House warns its members their faith will be tested. There's been an assault against you. And I want you to know the enemy's tried to shake you, come against you. There's been an, an attack against your life. It has been a deliberate strategy and attack of hell. Aaron, sit down. Just sit down, all right? I'm here no. with you. Only 45 no. minutes the into the deprogramming, and no. the struggle for Aaron's mind has begun. You don't. either. You don't. No. No, you don't. Don't. Now what? You don't. Leave me alone. Sit down. No, Mom. Aaron, Mom. Love me if you want to do this. You might love me, but you're not going at it right. You may don't know it. I think what you're doing is you're just trying to get me out of that church. You don't. It's two hours into the deprogramming. And the church is right, and you're better off without her. Who's you should be adopted by somebody in the church, right? You wanted to be adopted by somebody in the church, or somebody in the church was going to adopt you. Did I ever say that? And did anybody? So then it's a lie. No one in the church ever even said one word about adopting you. They never said any such thing. That's a lie. I'm not happy if it comes down to where she didn't want me. Uh-huh. She wants you. Why do you think we're doing this? So, so then, then, then correct me if I'm wrong. Someone in the church did, in fact, talk about adopting you. Yes. Okay. I think that there's a great deal of mystique surrounding deprogramming. You do believe in the Bible, right, Aaron? It's just talking. I know exactly what it says. And, and reasoning things is, out. This is my point. And really just uh, having a conversation, a dialogue. But so, I have my own beliefs that go with that scripture. And of course, many members are, are very hard to reach. Just because we don't believe what you believe, we're wrong. Have you ever thought about why is it that everybody speaks in tongues at the same time? Yeah, when everybody's supposed to have their own relationship with God. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three. Ross hopes to break through to Aaron by finding inconsistencies in the doctrine of the potter's house, also known as the door. I think that scripture is pretty clear, isn't it? I don't interpret it that way. So, I read it differently. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by let three. It be by two or at the most by three two or at the most three now how many people speak in tongues That's at the door does the door believe that this has value yes is this their rule book yes well then they're breaking the rules that's my point. They okay, break the rules. rules. You believe what you want, I'll believe what I want. I got this fear that he's going to hate me forever because of this. Now I want to show but you one other thing. He hated me to begin with when I brought him in here. I mean, are they about the Bible or are they just a bunch of guys who want to control people? I mean, that's the real issue. It's not the same kid. Um, Rick's my last hope. Do you blame yourself for this? Blame myself? It was Marna who first joined the Potter's house after her second divorce, partly to strengthen family ties. She demanded her sons attend services. Months later, she became disillusioned, and she took the family out of the church. I made a mistake of picking a cult on the church. But by then, Aaron was a committed follower and refused to leave. I don't think that when you went into the church, you really knew what you were getting involved in. Yeah, I trusted my mom, but she said, okay, this is a good Your church. mom made a mistake. I trusted her. She she's made, made a mistake. mistake. She's making a mistake now. She made a mistake when she entered the church, Maybe but it wasn't was. a mistake based on the fact that she had all of the facts. It was just something that happened. Well, how could a mom do this to their son? How can she? It seems like I didn't have the time for my kids that I should have taken. And Aaron's always needed more attention than the rest of them. I don't know if it's because it's middle child or, or what it is. I don't want to talk about this anymore. I don't want to talk to you guys. What are you doing? What are you doing, Mom? What brought Aaron to this place is not very clear. Is he a deeply disturbed boy who is vulnerable to mind control? or a normal troubled teenager dealing with the pain of growing up. He's smoking pot and he was um, taking um, speed and stuff like that.
Michelle Northcutt has known Aaron since the fifth grade. So give me an idea what, what he was like before the drugs, before the changes. He was like, he was nice, he cared about people, and he like, he was just really sweet, and you know, he cared about other people and everything, and he would listen to them, and you know. Aaron was caught with drugs in seventh grade and sent to a 45-day rehabilitation program. He claims the Potter's House helped him become drug-free, and he began to spread the church's message. This is the attendance book? Yes, uh, there's Aaron right there. Teacher Dennis Stovall tried to talk with Aaron about his absenteeism. He was here one, he missed three. He was here one, he missed five, six. But eventually, Aaron was thrown out of school. He said, I'm gonna become an evangelist preacher. And I said, uh, well, I was a little bit, I guess, surprised. And I said, well, don't you need education for that? What did you think when you're hearing all this? Mm -hmm. The truth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw a young man who's gone from one high to the next. He's gone from the high of drugs to the high of God. And uh, it bothered me. And yet, I believe that most highs eventually wear off, and I felt this would. But Aaron became even more involved with the church. And after he was expelled from school, more at odds with his mother. Finally, he ran away from home. And then I heard Marna calling from the back of the church. Um, I found him. Officer Lisa Coffey went with Marna Perrin to the Potter's house, looking for Aaron. He was hiding in a baptismal tank behind the altar. I went over to where he was, and we got him out of the tank. As soon as he came out of the tank and stepped down towards Mom, he ran up to her. He put a hand on her forehead and put the other hand up in the air like this and started trying to cast demons out of her. I don't want to sleep here. I'll call the cops. You guys cannot keep me sleeping in this house. That is wrong. That is, Lee, you cannot do that. It is now 10 p.m. No, wait, Mom. I want to talk to the police. Four hours into the deprogramming. Police aren't going to do anything here. We'll see, we'll see. That's the kid of just saying, hey, like, take my son, take my son, do anything you want with him. You have to do what I tell you to do because you're only 14 years old. Just listen, Aaron, Aaron, you know, the bottom listen. line is is that you had a happy family before you got yeah. involved well, in this we church. We got involved with church. And what the church we has done is turn, is turn no, you... Happy family. No, we, we didn't. No, we didn't. Yeah. yeah. As long as everybody obeyed the pastor and they all went to the church and listened and obeyed the men at the church, the things were happy. When I couldn't leave and you guys forced me, forced me. Sue me. I've tried to walk out and they literally forced me down. I, I don't know where it is. It's some, somewhere downtown. Aaron, no. your mother is My mom crazy. drove me over here and she's she's keeping me here. She's saying I have to stay the night here with them and everything. And I can't leave or nothing. I'm 14. Police confirm Marna's right to hold Aaron against his will. Hi, this is Marna Perrin. It's 11.30. Rick wants a few hours alone with Aaron. This is a very tough case. The door is a tough church, or the potter's house, as they called here. And this is a tough case. And... They've done a very thorough job of using their techniques on this young young man. It's you, very sad. You feeling sad? Yeah. About what? Well, I can't believe my mom's doing this to me. I think she convinced everybody. You think this is all her? Yeah, I know it is. You don't think she's doing this because she cares about you? Well, I, don't, I don't think she realizes what she's doing. What is she doing? It's not how you put together a relationship. You think that's what she's, what she's trying to do? Yeah. I think she does. She loves me, but she doesn't she, she don't show it right. She don't show it the normal way. Okay. Well, we're going to go now, but we're going to be back tomorrow, okay? We'll try to get good nights to Are we going to listen to the lies of hell? I choose to believe God. Good morning. Day two in Anchorage. Stage two begins. Things, uh, Deprogrammer Rick Ross wants to resolve the contradictions he heard in yesterday's session. 
Is Marna Perrin right that her son is lost in a cult? Or is Aaron right in defending his faith? Don't you understand? First stop, the Anchorage Police Department. How's Aaron doing? The same type of it's like he's out physically, but he's not out mentally. And he claims the church really didn't do anything wrong, that uh, Mrs. Perrin is at fault in everything. Actually, when I first talked to her, I was a little skeptical myself until I started digging into it. And everything she says was exactly what was going on. Investigator Jack Chapman. Legally, it's a church. Well, you can't dispute that. Well, I, just I, I question the methods they use on impressionable children. The constant meetings, five, six, seven times a week. Uh, you know, he was not going to school and going to the church. Chapman interviewed Aaron after he ran away from home and was found at the Potter's House baptismal pool. A police department videotape shows Aaron's loyalty to the church. Why don't you change churches? Because I can't. Why can't you? Because God wants me to church. It's hard to say. What yeah. makes you think God wants you in this particular church? Or... You guys would understand if I told you so. Well, try me. I'm trying to understand, son. It's because God told me, basically. And the boy is totally convinced that his mother is possessed by the devil. And that makes her evil. Therefore, he doesn't want to be with her. Your mother wants you to become a drug addict? She does what she told me. She said, I'd rather you have you back up drugs than in this church. Okay, Aaron, why don't you sit tight and I'll be with you in just a minute. I'll go find your mother. Some of the most revealing moments come when Chapman leaves the room. Another side of Aaron emerges. He could be any teenager, alone with a mirror. It's bizarre. A very bizarre story. But I think it could happen to any kid, any family, under the right circumstances. Next, on to psychologist Raymond Feggi, who has been counseling both Aaron and Marna for two years. Well, you met with Aaron, I guess. Yeah. We met last night, and it started, it started out pretty hot. It wasn't easy. Yeah, they've got him anesthetized at this point, where he's not, he's not thinking. He's just kind of like a robot. This is what they said. We are your family, you know. You haven't had a family. And um, uh, this is... Um, this is where Aaron was vulnerable. There's absence of a father. And financially, of course, the family has not been very secure. And one family in particular who took him in, big home and all the uh, trimmings, uh, this uh, is attractive to a, to a boy in, in this, this condition. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your time. time. The devil says, go down to try psychology. Go down and see the psychiatrist. Jesus says, watch and pray, amen. May we talk to you for a second? Can we talk to you for no, a second? That's right. Praise God. Anyways, Jesus loves you guys. We tried repeatedly to speak to the Potter's House church well, members. Well, we just wanted to know a little bit about the Potter's House, the services. Oh, okay. We're going to have to have somebody else. We went by the Anchorage jail to tape a Saturday service conducted by the Potter's House. Then why, then why can't we see it? Because we don't want it filmed. That makes a shroud of mystery around the church. That you know, that's, you know mystery's mystery. Well, I don't understand why, why this anger. We have, hey, God, God knows what's going on. God knows your guys' cover. God knows it all. And one day when we stand before him, we'll all be there, and the Holy Ghost video camera will be on. You guys have a good day. We spoke by phone to Pastor Bob Overson in Anchorage and Wayman Mitchell, who founded the Potter's House in Prescott, Arizona in 1970. Neither would respond to our questions. Hi. May I see Pastor Overson, please? Why are you doing this to me? We don't want it to be hostile. We just want to have a you few words. Either. Why don't you leave? In other words, the world is not a peaceful place. The only way we could tape a Sunday service was with a hidden camera. Until we were asked to leave. It was not the secrecy that disturbed Marna Perrin. The devil has tried to assault each and every one in this place. It was the church message. Don't you listen to the lies of the psychologists and these deadbeat preachers. The message that put down classroom education. It's not sitting down in some classroom atmosphere and I want you to know reading from a textbook. A potentially disturbing message. It's your father, your mother, your brother. After Marna left the church, the pastor warned Aaron directly in a sermon last December that his mother might go to hell. Even though your mom's not here, your mom's at stake. 
There's more at stake, Aaron. It's not a cult. We just believe in Jesus, and we um, we don't require anybody to come here. They can come. The very few church members who would talk to, uh, defended the Potter's House. We just believe the Bible. And, and the charges that there's mind control going on. Oh uh, no, uh uh, there's no mind. How can you control. be sure? You I've been a Christian for ten years. Several cult watchdog groups have files of complaints about the Potter's House church practices. The Christian Research Institute, which monitors and supports Christian outreach, does not recommend the Potter's House and calls it, quote, at best an aberrant church and at worst a church with cultic practices. According to the Potter's House, there are more than 500 branches around the world. I mean, I'll go to this church the rest of my life as long as I'm alive. This church has done that for me. What has what it done? It was though? I don't done understand. for me. It kept me away from drugs. There's just some people saying that what's happening here is mind control. That, yeah, mind they, control. They get people off drugs, no, but they're also no, controlling your mind. Is that what you think the church has to be? I don't know. I'm trying to find uh, out. No, I don't. I have a good time. I enjoy this church. It makes me happy. They started it. The Potter's House Church in every single situation, Aaron. It's 10.30 a.m. Rick Ross is back, armed with new facts. And Dr. Feggie has told me that things have been tough for you. For his work, he receives $350 a day, plus expenses. But your mother finally said, look, enough is enough, and I've got to save my family. Today, Aaron seems withdrawn. Some of the things that I'm saying make some sense. Unlike yesterday, he is sitting and mostly silent. Do you know what happened, Aaron? You know, just jump in there at any time. And you got, you got to, you got to talk, Aaron. It would be nice if you would talk yeah. more. Watch this. Hours of the deprogramming are consumed studying video cassettes. And I want you to think about a few things when we look at them. Not training tapes. Today you're going to hear some bizarre stories. But talk shows, documentaries, and news reports detailing church activities. Okay. Once you're involved, absolute commitment. But if you ever slack off, it's bad news. They work the scriptures so that you will obey them. But they're just not about anything except control and recruitment and keeping people in their church. Ross flatly denies that what he does is reverse brainwashing. Absolutely not. I have no theology that I'm trying to impart on him. I'm not trying to deprogram and then reprogram. I see that as totally unethical. Aaron, are you hearing a lot of stuff you identify with? I don't know. It's, it kind of seems like there's two sides to it. It kind of seems like there's just two sides to it. Well, let's break. Let's, let's have something to eat, and let's just goof off, okay? We've been ripped off royally. Now we're going to be good to ourselves. It's Thursday, 1 o'clock. We're talking less than 24 hours since Aaron first walked in that room. What do you think? I think we're moving along well, and that Aaron is sorting through things effectively, and he's thinking. He's not just angry. He's not just belligerent. He's actually thinking. He's not conning you. No, I don't think Aaron, Aaron is faking at all. He's unpredictable. Marna is not so sure as she gets ready to go home for a change of clothes. I think part of it is an act. Why do you think it's an act? Because I'm real skeptical. I've been dealing with these people for the last several months, and I don't trust anything about them. Nothing. Now, when you're saying these people, you're including your son? <laughs> He's still, as far as I'm concerned, still one of those people. He's physically removed from him right now, but I think psychologically, I think he's still bound. And one of Aaron's qualities has always been to bat those brown eyes and, you know, agree with you just so that um, he kind of gets his own way. I believe what you were bringing them to was the ultimate good. See, what she's talking about is friendship, low-key discipling techniques. What's happening, Martin? This think Aaron you think that you got you think that you can that you can forgive your mom and that you can work things out 
for you. It's getting pretty quiet in here. <laughs> Welcome home, son. <laughs> the family understands why Aaron was attracted to the church. In a few moments, we discover what the church saw in Aaron. Aaron's deprogramming in Anchorage may seem isolated and far away, but it reflects a growing dispute that hits home for all too many American families. The issue is this. Church groups and deprogrammers accuse each other of violating one of America's most basic rights, the individual's right to worship as he or she pleases. The deprogrammers and the families who hire them say the religious groups use mind control, overwhelming psychological pressure that robs members of their free will. It's a question the highest courts in the country are beginning to consider. Can people really be manipulated this way? We, um, this woman thinks the answer needle. is yes. A brochure Cult Awareness Network. She is Cynthia Kisser, the Did executive director of the Cult Awareness Network, a Hi, national clearinghouse of information on controversial oh, okay. religious groups. Kisser herself was once a member of a cult. The Cult Awareness Network really just wants to educate the public about the effects of um, mind control. We're not trying to tell people what to believe. All we are saying is that if the practices of an organization deceive you into accepting a belief system that you had no choice in, then there's something wrong. The entire anti-cult enterprise is based on the assumption that there is something called mind control or coercive persuasion. Reverend Dean that Kelly is director of Religious Liberties for the National Council of Churches. Use common sense. If the secret has been found of how to control people at a distance without using force, someone who knows how to do that would not have to be content with any rickety little religious movement. They could rule the world. You're listening to Wisconsin Public Radio. I'm Steve Paulson. We talk about cults during this next hour with the Reverend Dr. Leo Champion, a Baptist minister and director of the Wisconsin Committee on Religious Liberty and Freedom, and Ford Green, an attorney, an ex-member of the Unification Church, and now, as he describes it, a cult buster. Ford Green, is it appropriate for people to kidnap uh, uh, members of uh, what you would call co cult organizations. Uh, does the parent have the right to go in there and seize that person? My own personal position is yes. Uh, the parent does have the right. Leo Champion, your response. Number one, kidnapping is a crime. If I go out and, and kidnap someone, regardless to the situation, I go to jail. Let's talk a moment about so-called deprogramming. You are opposed to it, but, but what's wrong with it? For one thing, it's criminal. For me to attempt to force you to give up your most intimate and important convictions, I think, is one of the greatest wrongs on the face of this earth. In fact, I have referred to it as spiritual gang rape, where a group of people can force one lone victim to be subjected to attack upon his or her most sacred convictions until they relinquish them. Now, what could be worse than that? We have a number of callers waiting. Let's go to the phones. Yes, hello? Yes. This is Britta Adelson. I've been trying to get into the program for about an hour since I'm here already. And we so need to get to the point. Go ahead. Yes. Um, first of all, I was um, forcibly abducted, kidnapped, and held for eight days. I was Britta Adelson, to, uh, a member of the Unification Church in Colorado, was abducted in 1987 by deprogrammers hired by her parents. She showed up at the radio station to tell her story. It's a, it's a horrible experience. And I hate for, for anybody to ever have to experience it because it's a, what they are trying to break you down completely psychologically and mentally. There were times when I thought I was going to die, now physically and spiritually. The effort was unsuccessful and Adolfson pressed kidnapping charges against the 2D programmers. Attorney Ford Green defended the two men and last fall they were acquitted. I thought that I was going to be able to do something important, something decent for people. David Moko was a member of the Unification Church in California. 
he too was abducted by deprogrammers hired by his parents. And I was struggling. I mean, I am uh, literally struggling. I remember holding on to a lamp pole, screaming, you know, leave me alone, leave me alone. Only this time it was successful. And David Boko sued the Unification Church for fraud based on deceptive recruitment. Hey, David. Mark Hi. Mark Nelson. How, How are, are you? you? Good. Moko's lawyer, Ford Green. Religions certainly have rights, but so do everybody else. And religion's rights are not such as they should be allowed to walk roughshod all over the rights of everybody else. Last October, a big victory for Green. The California Supreme Court ruled that Moko may indeed have been a victim of mind control and upheld his right to sue for fraud. The Unification Church is appealing that decision to the United States Supreme Court. In the case of 14-year-old Aaron, who's a minor, some of the legal issues do not apply, but the moral and ethical questions remain. I'm feeling real happiness. I mean, real happiness. And it's been a long time. <laughs> it's a real good feeling. It's a new day. Aaron has been in the apartment for more than 36 hours. The process begins yet again. What happened? What went on there? I mean, those people, they got slain in the Holy Ghost and... More and talk. Had all these miracles and everything. How in the heck does all that go on if these guys are, are fake? More videotapes. That's Marjo Gortner, the preaching machine. Then God spoke the crucial word. He said, will you preach the word? Marjo, a self-proclaimed fraud. Before I had a decision to make. And I said, yes, Lord, I will. Would some of you get out $5 or $10? Bring what you would for Jesus tonight. Come on. Look at it and analyze it for yourself. Jesus is so good to me tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I praise the Lord. Look at this, not from the supernatural, because we know that Marjo is like a fake. People get scared. They get scared when they leave a group like Potter's House because they think, well, there really was something supernatural going on in there. Those pastors, they had power. Supernatural power. Thank you, Jesus. I believe he's going to touch you right now. Say thank you, Jesus. Sister, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Crowd's getting worked up. People are getting worked up. He knows how to do it. He knows how to push them along. And then he says, you got to have faith. You got to have faith. And then right at that one moment, he goes, in the name of Jesus. See? Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. You see how he does it? I mean, he gets everybody so worked up. He gets them so psyched up. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. He's about to go down. And she's down for the camera. Okay. So. Like it right there. <laughs> One, two, three. You're up for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Ross is encouraged because Aaron seems more responsive. It's more like going to a Sunday night football game or something. Preaching is a role Aaron himself was being groomed for. So this, I believe, was part of the plot, was that they were going to take over this kid and he was going to be the, quote, evangelist of the age they would be the real potter's house number one boy beverly carlson is an ex-member of the potter's house he was out evangelizing the teenagers and you could sit in church and look at the whole role from one side to the other it was all aaron's aaron's boys psychologist dr raymond fedgy when, when he um, started to get really involved in the church i started to get a little concerned because at that point he started to alienate himself not only from his brother but from his friends and uh, started preaching in school and you know pointing his finger and telling these kids you're sinners he was the star and the more kids he brought in the more positive strokes and the more um pastor would praise him from the pulpit and you know this was our kind of man for the church the problem that we have now in this congregation is that we don't have enough ministry to keep up with what god is doing a ministry cannot grow beyond its capability and beyond its capacity to minister amen this is one of the 
prerequisites, I guess you would say, for belonging there. It's evangelizing, you know, bring the people in. Because I do a whole thing on you. Then, you know, I sort of like get down to, now I'm going to pray the prayer and everyone bow your heads. And all of a sudden you go, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a horrible way to make it a is. living, it's though. It is, terrible. Taking advantage of people it's and fraud. everything. And also, look at that man in the blue shirt when he was lying down. He was fried. He was fried. I've met people that Wouldn't have done... Wouldn't those people sue him for that, though? After they made this tape, didn't they see him say, hey, wait a minute, man, we want they, to they, that for fraud or something? You, you think about the people in Potter's house. Would they be willing to let some, to admit to themselves and to admit publicly that their experience in tongues is not... Finally, after 44 hours of anger, tears, and reconciliation, Ross decides to end the deprogramming. You should go start up the car. I think we're through crisis, that it's no longer a situation where Aaron would run from me. <laughs> or exhibit the kind of hostility that he did the first night. And that in itself is a breakthrough. When I walked in here, and I wasn't expecting what was going to happen. Live from New York, it's Saturday night. <laughs> what it did is just made me realize what was going on before. What? Like what kind like, of stuff? If people could see, you know, the, all the th all the stuff and the programs and stuff like that of what the Potter's House was doing in the other churches, then I think people would have thought different about it when they first walked in. People were claiming you were brainwashed. Do you think you were brainwashed in the church? I don't think I was brainwashed. You don't think you were brainwashed? No, I disagreed with some of the stuff, and I never gave it totally my all. So, so you didn't think that they deprogrammed you. It's, You're saying you, you didn't think you were programmed in the first place. I didn't think they deprogrammed I think they speeded up the process. What process were they speeding up? Of uh, building trust with my mother and my family. What do you think of the church now? I really don't know now. I mean, now it's like, I'm real confused about what they're doing, why they're doing it. Somebody must have said it's not over until it's over and then it's still not over, so. There are counseling sessions that will happen from now on with Dr. Feggi. I believe that Aaron will go on and, and sort through the rest of this, but that the crisis is over and that he's going to be fine. On his first night of freedom, Aaron gave some loud indications he was back to his old self. But for how long? We'll find out when we return. It's been three weeks since Aaron's come home from the deprogramming, and the family's had time to evaluate if it made any difference, if the ordeal was worth it. <laughs> so what's been going on in the last few weeks? since we last left you. He's a lot better. He's my brother again. I mean, I never, he was actually laughing with me in bed. Mm -hmm. And I haven't laughed at that kid since we were back in 1980 in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> when he was laughing with me. And you had a sense of intimacy, yeah. a sense of that old Aaron. The thing I saw immediately was he was more open with his emotions and feelings. His eyes have just looked so strange this past year just shark eyes that's what i call them shark eyes with no sparkle no emotion and they're just you know <laughs> like like dr Feggy says yeah sparkling. dr Feggy says he's back in the land of the living now i definitely have to agree with that what do you think of it now it's been three weeks i guess you you can call it partly worth it i guess because they kind of opened my eyes like, I should be spending more time with my family and stuff. Did you know what was going on when you started lashing out? That's the law. No, no, I don't. I'll call the cops. I, I knew what was going on, but I didn't want to believe it at first. I just tried to block it out. Why? Because I just didn't want the fact of me being locked up like that. You know, one of your teachers said that it was just like you went from one addiction to the other. Like, you like drugs, and then you became addicted to religion. Yeah. See, that was pretty accurate. You think that's accurate? Yeah. <laughs> so you think you're addicted to religion? 
<laughs> Think oh. about it and look me straight in the eye. <sighs> well, I don't know how would you how would you call it? I mean, it, remember how it was? I could it stop if I wanted to. You you could stop. Yeah, I could I could stop religion if I wanted to. I mean, I don't I don't have to do it. You think it's a cult? Well, not right now. Not until I can get my answers from them. You know. I mean, you can't get both sides. You gotta, just like you guys, you guys get, need both sides of the story. Yesterday when I spoke to Aaron, he wasn't very clear about the church. Yes. Aaron's not anti-church, anti-Potter's house I realized at this point. that um, I wasn't either when I first came out of it. It takes a long time, and I think that that's due to because there's still some feelings about people there. You know, you still feel attached to some of the people there. The whole point of, of him being deprogrammed was to try to reestablish our relationship, try to break down that wall of he was a saint and I was the devil. <laughs> she says she has her son back. That's what she says. And she's, and what? I agree. <laughs> I'm her son. <laughs> Dr. Mark Galanter of the New York University School of Medicine has done a study of people who leave church groups, some on their own and some after deprogramming. He found that many people went through tough times at first, nightmares or tremendous feelings of guilt. But after a while, most of those in the study began new lives. That doesn't answer critics who say deprogramming itself is wrong. And it's just too soon to say what will happen to Aaron. For now, his is a story with no neat ending. I'm Dan Rather. Until next week, that's 48 hours. This is America, and we won't go back! Trouble in coal country. If I'm a bad guy because I create jobs, I'm a bad guy. Miners and management locked in a life and death struggle. Strikers putting their bodies on the line. And strike breakers crossing the line. This is a fight for freedom. Is it the end of the line for unions in America? 48 hours on strike next week. The whole town wants to help them have a baby. It's a private matter getting a little too public. Tim Matheson and Margaret Colin star in Warm Hearts, Cold Feet, a romantic comedy that's pregnant with laughter. Next. For a transcript of 48 hours, send $4 to Journal Graphics, 267 Broadway, New York, New York, 13007. Others from joining. Former Potter's House disciple Dave Diver told News Tonight why he is opposed to the church's teachings. In this church for 13 years, I propagated the gospel as they saw it for that, that period of time. And uh, people come in here, they have an initial, initial good pull of the gospel here, but then, uh, it, but, then, but then the brainwashing, the manipulation, the, the guilt and condemnation that it starts, they start to base their lives on here is wrong. It's not right. News Tonight also tried to contact Potter's House officials, but they declined to comment. And uh, if you stand on the sidewalk, that's public property. If you come farther than that, we will have a police come. So, please, you listen to me. This is not personal towards you. We're not angry or attacked. But uh, that's all I have to say. I'll give so the ministers opposed to a church known as The Door marched outside a large revival in Phoenix tonight. The demonstrators, or former church members, charge, among other things, The Door is a potentially dangerous cult. Mike Mackla attended the event tonight, and he's here with more. Mike, is this a new organization? Well, Diane, it was founded about 10 years ago by a pastor in Prescott. Since then, it has grown to more than 600 churches across the country. About 2,000 people gathered in a convention hall tonight for a church revival. These people are part of a fast-growing religious organization called The Door. It was founded by this man, Wayman Mitchell, a Prescott pastor, referred to by some former members as the leader of a cult. And I'm one of the members that left this group uh, a wreck. It took me four years to recover from the damage that this group did. Once you're involved, 
absolute commitment, but if you ever slack off, it's bad news because you have nowhere else to turn. Another former member says he gave more than $60,000 to the group. Door officials, he says, continually refuse to disclose how the money is being spent. The way this church is set up is one man is totally right. And no, he cannot make mistakes because God is behind him. And you cannot question his finances or where the money goes. Meanwhile, a member of the church discounted charges leveled by the protesters. No one is brainwashed, you know, or whitewashed or blackwashed or whatever. Everybody here loves God, <coughs> knows that Christ is coming soon, and we're just here to have a good time. Tonight, church members praised healing miracles involving others in the congregation. Outside, the debate continued with... And that's where Frank Camacho is right now. Frank? Well, Cameron, a good old-time revival meeting just uh, let go a few minutes ago. As you can tell, a lot of the folks are still filing out. But the event serves only as a backdrop for some serious allegations leveled against the Christian fellowship church known as The Doors. Willing to heal, willing to deliver. Willing to... These are the believers who tonight heard the gospel, gave testimony, and praised Jesus. Many are door members. Here inside, they share fellowship. Outside, before the revival, there is suspicion. Yeah, I know. Don't even show that. Don't give them an opportunity. Sir. Two church members are telling the faithful not to talk to reporters or to those picketing the event. This gentleman over there telling you not to talk to us? Former church member Debbie Christensen says the obedience is to be expected. Brainwash, that's it. You just do whatever they tell you. So Christensen considers herself one of the brainwashed. Now she relies on her husband and two children for the love and support she once thought could only come from the door. I was a really loving and trusting person. And from the time I got in there to the time I got out, I trusted nobody. I only listened. I mean, I gave my entire life to that church. Cult deprogrammer Rick Ross accuses the door of controlling all aspects of its members' lives, both religious and personal. They operate under a system called headship, where they believe that people really need to abdicate to a large extent their ability to make decisions for themselves. Ross says door members are exposed to cult-like indoctrination and retention methods. It's a we-they mentality where anyone who may be a family member, a parent, who is outside of the organization is seen as evil or threatening. The Reverend Wayman Mitchell is the founder of The Door. We preach the gospel just like any other fundamental Christian church in Pentecostal church, absolutely. These picket signs and the people who carry them, says Reverend Mitchell, are part of a conspiracy orchestrated by Rick Ross, who happens to be Jewish. Every Jew is an antichrist. He's anti-Christian. Absolutely, that's what a Jew is. That's what Mr. Ross is. He's a highly paid religious mercenary. Uh, he's a Jewish crusader. He's anti-Christian Jewish crusader. That's what Mr. Ross is. Now, Ross denies that he is anti-Christian. As evidence, he cites his resume, which contains numerous examples of the hundreds of hours that he's volunteered to enter denominational committees and whatnot. Now, this is not the first time that there's been a confrontation between the members and the former members, and it's not likely to be the last. Both sides are, appear to be unwilling to give an inch. That would seem to be the case. Thank you, Frank. Crusade, and it's going on tonight, right now, in fact, at Pacific Plaza. But while this revival meeting went on, there was a protest. Janine McCure is live at Pacific Plaza, and Janine, what exactly were they protesting? Well, they call it a radical group, a destructive group, a fringe group. The group is called the Door. They say they're like any other church. Protesters say the church has taken people, brainwashed them, and taken over their lives. That's what it looked like inside. This is what was happening outside. It's not bitterness, ma'am. I don't know what your bitterness is all about, but, but I do know that Jesus is the best thing in all the world. You bet. Among the protesters tonight, an ex-member. Debbie Christensen claims she was raped by a door member, that her pastor helped cover it up. And she says the church preaches a constant message of absolute loyalty. Anybody that came against the church or against the people themselves was of the devil. Like my mom. My mom was a Southern Baptist. If she tried to get me out, she was speaking for the devil, trying to coax me away from the group. Rick Ross is not a psychologist, but works as a deprogrammer getting people out of the church. He says members have been, in some cases, systematically kept away from their families. In other cases, have given 30 to 40 percent of their paychecks to the ministry, 
that they turn to the door for advice on every aspect of their lives. The issue really is not how they believe, but how the group has treated the members, how they've encouraged them to break away from their family, and how they've totally dominated their life. Make no mistake about it, this is an orchestration by Mr. Rick Ross, who is an uh, is a uh, anti-Christian crusader. He's a reformed Jew. Mitchell went on to say this is like any other fundamentalist religion. But when we tried to ask members about it, this man warned them not to talk. I heard you talking to telling people not to talk to us. Can you tell me why? Can you tell me why you're not? What's wrong with people telling us about the church and what goes on here? Once inside, though, on a cue from the pastor, some did talk. What happens if someone leaves the church? They leave the church. People can, you know, people do what they want. God gave us a free will. We can do what we want to do. Now, Wayne and Mitchell, the pastor we talked to, says Rick Ross is a self-proclaimed deprogrammer with no credentials who charges $500 a day. Ross says he has handled about 100 deprogramming cases, Kenton Patty, four from this group that he sees $35 an hour or $350 a day. Okay. An in-depth look next on Eyewitness News. Not religion. It's one of the most dynamic movements in America.